Hey everybody, this is Chris from Paramount Retirement Solutions and this video is going to be for folks that are turning 65, getting on Medicare for the first time, but either you're still working or your spouse is still working. So a lot of times when you're going through that situation, you might think, well, I'm still covered at work or I'm still covered uh, if my wife is still working or if my husband is still working and uh, I don't need to do anything about Medicare. I'm going to keep that plan. I don't need to do anything about it. However, there's a lot of things to consider and if you make the wrong decision, it really could come back and bite you later because it can limit your options and really cost you thousands of dollars of unnecessary either medical expenses out of pocket or premiums that you're paying for coverage that you don't need. So this video is basically to show you the thought process. It's not necessarily to tell you what to do, but it's to show you the things that you need to think about, questions that you need to ask, important points that you really need to consider when you're making your Medicare decision at 65 if you still have the option to be covered under a group plan, whether it's because of current employment or if possibly you're covered under retiree coverage. So we're going to start out by looking at uh, options for current employment, whether you or your spouse are still working and you're covered under a group plan. So the first thing you need to do is to ask your HR department, ask your benefits department, or possibly even your group plan uh, coordinator, ask them if they require that you enroll in either Medicare Part A and or Medicare Part B. Um, if your company has less than 20 employees, not less than 20 people on the group policy, but less than 20 employees, this means that Medicare Part A and Part B are required because Medicare will be your primary insurance. However, if the company is larger, your group plan can still be primary and you can just sign up for Medicare Part A and it can be secondary. So if you're required to sign up for Part B, if your job requires it, your uh, group plan requires it, and you don't sign up for Part B, you could possibly pay a late enrollment penalty later. So you definitely want to start off by asking uh, your HR department, benefits department, if they require you sign up for Part B. Uh, one thing keep, to keep in mind is it's often difficult to find somebody who knows those answers. Even for a larger company, it's hard to find the right person in that benefits department that's going to know the answer. However, you do want to be persistent and find out what you need to do, what you're required to do, so you're not going to come back and be uh, penalized later. Second thing you want to do is find out how your coverage will change when you turn 65 and become Medicare eligible. Uh, generally, companies, especially larger companies, are not allowed to change your coverage at 65. However, your premiums could change significantly. So this is another thing you need to find out and factor in. Uh, also, find out if your group plan is considered creditable coverage. Kind of going back to the point I made uh, with my first point about seeing if your group plan requires you sign up for Medicare. If your group plan is not considered creditable coverage, then Medicare could again charge you that late enrollment penalty later on when you do sign up for both parts of Medicare. Also, keep in mind that if you leave your group plan and decide to get original Medicare with your own supplemental insurance, you may not be able to re-enroll in your group plan even if you're still working or your spouse is still working and you're covered under that plan. So ask that question and uh, keep that in mind as well. Kind of tying into that same point, sometimes in rare situations, other benefits are tied to your group health plan. So for example, if your, your work matches your 401k contributions, or if they give you vision and dental, and you decide to drop your group health plan and get Medicare with your own supplement, a lot of times those benefits packages are package deals. So if you decide to discontinue your group plan, you possibly may be discontinuing your 401k matching benefit. Again, find that out from your benefits department. Another important point to factor in is cost of medications. Most people don't realize this, but once you get on Medicare and get Part D, which is a prescription part of Medicare, there's something called the donut hole. That's kind of a slang term for what's known as the coverage gap. In the coverage gap, basically your drug costs get very expensive. They start off more reasonably toward the beginning of the year and can get very expensive toward the middle end of the year if you get into this coverage gap. You can do so if the actual retail cost of your medications are very expensive. 
So if you're taking several either expensive generic drugs, expensive brand name drugs, or a mix of the two, even sometimes one expensive brand name drug, for example, Enbrel is an injectable drug that's incredibly expensive. If you're on expensive medications, this can easily drive you into the donut hole, which can make your drug costs total for the year uh, three, four thousand dollars or more. Things can get very expensive. Usually group plans though through employers don't have the donut hole. Their drug costs are much lower and especially more consistent throughout the year. So whether where a drug might cost you several hundred dollars for the year under a group policy, it might cost several thousands of dollars a year uh, under getting your own Medicare prescription insurance. So keep that in mind. So even if you're turning 65, let's say you're turning 65 in July and you're getting on Medicare for the first time, even though you may decide that it's in your best interest to sign up for original Medicare, get your own Medicare supplement insurances, your group plan may not let you disenroll until the next group enrollment period. So if at work you pick your plan late fall every year and it starts January 1st, even though your Medicare date might be July, they may not let you drop your group plan until next January. Another important point to consider is if you're drawing any type of Social Security income, you're going to be automatically signed up for Medicare Part A and Part B. Uh, this is generally going to apply more toward the spouse of someone who's still working rather than the employee that's covered under the group plan. Um, but if you don't do anything, you're going to be automatically signed up for both parts of Medicare. They're going to automatically start taking out the Medicare Part B premium out of your check. And by they, I mean the Social Security Administration. So if you decide that you don't want Medicare Part B, you want to stay under the group plan, and your benefits department says, no, you're not required to have Medicare Part B, you need to take action. You need to fill out the back of your Medicare card when it comes in the mail. There's an option that says, I do not want medical insurance, and you need to sign it, fill it out, and send it back to Social Security. Because it, another reason to do this, not only can you save money but not, by not paying an extra Part B premium when you don't need to, but if you do sign up for Medicare Part B when you first turn 65, you stay covered under the group plan. Once you do retire or once your spouse does retire and you do need to get your own Medicare insurance at that time, it could limit your options later. Another small little wrinkle in Medicare is something called HSAs. Those are health savings accounts. And basically the IRS lets you contribute money that, that's tax deductible toward a health savings account to be used toward qualified medical expenses. And when you use that money later on, it's also tax free. However, if you're enrolled in any part of Medicare, even Part A, which most people don't pay a monthly premium for, it may seem harmless to sign up for Part A, but just remember, if you do sign up for Part A, and even if you defer your Part B till later, you're no longer allowed to contribute to an HSA. So just kind of a, a planning uh, point to consider there. So one of the reasons why you would want to drop your group plan and get original Medicare along with your own supplemental insurance is every group plan is going to have some type of network restrictions. Most plans at work are going to be HMOs, they're going to be PPOs, and that just means there are certain doctors and hospitals and healthcare providers that are going to participate in your group plan network. However, if you get Medicare, get your own supplemental policy, this will greatly expand the folks that you can see, especially nationally. So if you really wanted to go see a doctor at Mayo Clinic, at the Cleveland Clinic, a lot of times your group plan won't let you see them. Uh, or if you do, it'll be at a much higher cost where getting Medicare with a Medigap policy will let you see them uh, at a much lower expense. Some of the clients that I work with, uh, basically they've got one foot out the door. They're ready to retire. They're not quite ready to pull the trigger but they'd like to be able to just show up for work one day and say, I've had enough, I quit, uh, I'm done. If you're in that situation, you may want to think about getting Medicare Part A and B, even if you're still covered under your group plan, because if you do that, when you're ready to kind of make a quick getaway, so to speak, uh, that'll let you, uh, it'll already have Medicare in place, and it will allow you to then get a Medicare supplement and let everything get turned on and put in place much faster. So really with this big picture, you want to do a cost-benefit analysis. And I know that's kind of a scary term, 
but that just means you want to find out how much you're paying in premium for your group plan, how much your premium would be for Medicare and your own supplemental insurance, then consider what your potential out-of-pocket expenses are. Think about what your deductibles and your maximum out-of-pocket amounts are with your group plan. Think about how much your deductibles and your maximum out-of-pocket amounts would be with Medicare and your own supplemental insurance. Look at them side by side, You know, again, considering uh, the networks and the restrictions you have to stay uh, in a group plan and not stay in if you get Medicare with a supplemental policy. Just look at everything side by side, try to be objective and really just figure out what you're getting based on what you're paying and let that help guide your decision. So to clarify a lot of these points, let's just take a look at a couple examples. So in this first example, uh, let's take a look at Linda. Linda works for a large employer, it's a large hospital. She is a widow and she pays $46 every two weeks for her employer group plan. They take it right out of her check. Her plan does not require that she enroll in Medicare Part B when she turns 65 and uh, her annual deductible is fairly low, $250 for the year and her maximum out of pocket is $1,000 annually. For Linda, it's gonna be best for her to stay with her employer coverage rather than get Medicare and her own supplemental insurances if she signed up for Medicare, she'd be paying $134 a month alone for that. Her out-of-pocket expenses with her work plan are low, so even if she could lower them a little bit by getting Medicare with a Medigap policy and a standalone drug plan, she'd likely pay a few thousand dollars annually in premiums for that coverage. If we compare that to spending $1,104, which is just her $46 every two weeks for the year for her group plan premium, uh, plus even if she has a bad health year of $1,000, in spending uh, her maximum out of pocket, uh, she's likely gonna spend considerably less for her, um, her group plan rather than getting Medicare with a supplemental insurance. Second example, take a look at Joe. Joe is still working at a machine shop and his wife Barb is the one turning 65. She is on his group plan right now. Between the two of them, they pay $640 a month and uh, Joe's premium would be only $120 a month alone if he was on the plan by himself. So their plan is an HMO, which means there's some network restrictions. They have a family deductible for the year of $2,000 and a maximum out of pocket for the year family is $5,000. Barb's fairly healthy. She only takes one generic medication for cholesterol. For them, it's almost uh, definitely gonna be better for Barb to leave Joe's plan, get Medicare with her own supplemental coverage. If she stayed on his plan, they'd have to pay over $500 a month more in premium for her to stay on. She can get Medicare with a Medigap plan and a standalone drug plan for half that amount typically. So this option would not only lower her out-of-pocket expenses, but it would also just kind of expand the choices of where she could go to get treated because she can see any doctor that takes Medicare rather than having to stay within their HMO network. Okay, so we just talked about the things to consider and kind of what your options are if you're still working and covered under a group plan or if your spouse is still working covered under that plan. However, if you're retired, you're most likely covered under a group plan if you have retiree coverage, but the situation is pretty different. Uh, for almost every retiree plan, once you become Medicare eligible, they're going to require that you get Part B. So if you're still working, Part B a lot of times is optional. If you're retired and decide to stay under that group plan, you'll almost be guaranteed to have to get Part B. So just like with current employment, you really want to find out how your coverage changes, your group plan changes when you turn 65. Uh, for If you're currently employed, a lot of times your coverage isn't going to change a whole lot at 65. However, under a retiree group plan, things generally change quite a bit at 65. So just keep that in mind and take that into account. The same thing to consider that we had to consider with your prescriptions with your Part D of Medicare, if you're still working, still applies to retiree insurance. So most retiree group plans don't have the donut hole. They don't have that coverage gap where your expensive medications could get incredibly expensive on the tune of several thousand dollars over the course of the year. So even though your premium of your group plan may go up quite a bit when you turn 65, if you're on expensive medications, it still might be best to stay with your group plan because that plan will generally have a much lower cost for your medications compared to Medicare Part D. And again, like I mentioned before, you really want to do that cost-benefit analysis comparing your premiums, your out-of-pocket expenses, and your network restrictions. 
and especially at this point, it's really best to work with a professional. Work with an independent agent that can represent many different plans, many different companies to help shop for you. I do that for folks. I don't charge for my services. I get uh, paid a small commission from the insurance company if I'm able to help you find a plan. So any good independent agent is really able to represent you to do what's in your best interest to help find the best plan for you. And if your best option is to stand either your current employment group plan or your retiree group plan, I'll tell you that. So let's take a look at a couple more examples here that apply specifically toward retiree coverage. So let's take a look at this third example is going to apply toward retiree coverage specifically. And Jeff retired from a small painters union a few years back, currently turning 65. His premiums are going to be going to $240 a month with that retiree coverage and he'll be required to sign up for Part B which is going to be another $134 a month. He could get Medigap insurance for $130 a month, however Jeff has an autoimmune disease and takes one very expensive brand name medication. This drug would run him $80 a month under his retiree plan, even after 65, but would run $3,500 a year annually if he left the group plan and enrolled under Medicare Part D. So in Jeff's situation, he uh, could save a little bit over $1,300 a year by going from the $240 a month premium to the $130 a month premium for the medical part of his coverage. However, for the drug part of his coverage, he would spend about $2,500 more for his drug costs by leaving. In Jeff's situation, it's going to be best for him to stay put and just to reevaluate down the road if anything changes. Uh, if his medication ever goes generic, he would likely be able to save a significant amount by getting his own Medicare uh, drug insurance and to leave the plan. Another thing that could happen too is uh, with his uh, retiree plan, generally as time goes on, benefits get worse. So if his premium really starts to climb or his out-of-pocket expenses really start to go up, then he can always reevaluate later and possibly leave his group plan and get Medicare with his own supplemental insurances. So basically in conclusion, what I found is whether you're working or whether you're retired, larger employers tend to offer richer benefits. So they'll tend to offer lower premium plans, lower uh, out-of-pocket expense plans, plans with better networks. So keep that in mind and that generally really uh, applies more toward current employment as opposed to a retiree coverage at 65. And also very, very few employers are going to offer decent, really if any, retiree coverage at 65. If you retire at 62, they may cover you for that three-year gap until you become Medicare eligible, but at 65, almost nobody is going to offer coverage that's, uh, that's halfway decent uh, when you become Medicare eligible. And every situation is unique. I know Medicare can get complex, but every employer group plan is different. Uh, a lot of times it could be based on your years of service. So you really, again, like I mentioned before, want to talk to an independent agent a non-captive agent like myself, someone that doesn't just represent one insurance company, that knows the market, that knows the market in your area, that can represent many, many different plans in your area to really help you shop and find your best choice. And really the last piece of advice I can give you is don't rush your decision. Do your homework, talk to the right people, be persistent. Hopefully this video has kind of given you a step-by-step -step process on what you need to find out. But get those answers, Think about things objectively and don't just put it off because making the wrong decision or a lot of times not doing anything when you turn 65 can really come back and bite you later. So hopefully this video has helped. I have my number at the bottom of the screen as well as my email address. So I'd love to be able to help you guys out and answer any questions you have. Take care.